Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Has anyone ever stayed up till midnight on New Year's Eve? Has anyone never made it? Be honest. Never made it to midnight. Cool. You know, my mom, what my mom does every year uh, is she, uh, she always watches the New, York, the New York like ball drop at 10 p.m. so she can go to bed early. Anyone else do that? I saw this video, uh, on, I think it was on like Instagram or something, and it was like parenting, like we, we won parenting. And it's like this like countdown on the TV and the kids are so excited, the countdown. It's like 8.35 p.m., something like that, and like New Year's Eve. But what we used to do as youth leaders is we, used, we had this brilliant idea. Let's do an all-nighter New Year's celebration with our students. Brilliant idea. It's a horrible idea. So what we would do, like this is just real, like we're like, let's just do a New Year's big celebration. What we do is we get like jump houses. We had like, I think one year we had like 150 students show up to this event. But like jump houses, we had like, we would always have a message. We'd always have worship. Sometimes you're bringing bands and we'd like give away. Like one, give, one year we gave away like a Xbox and a PlayStation. Like it was unbelievable. And all these people would come out and we would eat the worst kinds of food. We'd eat all these sugary drinks and we'd make it to midnight. But the problem with all-nighters is someone has to stay awake all night to make sure the kids aren't doing anything horrible. And always because they're like, you're the boss, you do it. I'm like, okay. And then half my team would be like, yeah, I'm out. It's like 12, 12.02, they're like, see you tomorrow. I'm coming back in the morning to clean. So then there's just like a handful of us with like 100 students trying to like make sure everything was safe. But the beautiful things, we never had any sort of accidents. We never had any sort of crazy things happen. But the thing about nighttime and the thing about midnight is, and when it gets dark, is that midnight, as we know, is the darkest time of day. But it's also, for some of us, one of the hardest times of day to stay up till. And so for me, I find the older I get, the harder it is for me to make it to midnight. And I, I don't go to bed super early. But like, for some of us, midnight is like a time that we've never actually made it to. And so what I want to do today, we're going to have a message today um, that we're going to be, I'm going to be talking about two men in the Bible and what their response was when midnight came. What, what, what did they respond to when midnight came? And if we all know midnight, again, midnight is the darkest, one of the darkest times of the day. One of the moments that is the hardest for us to actually go through and midnight comes. And we're going to talk about what happens to these men when the threat level in our life turns to midnight. What happens when midnight is coming, when the threat level in our life is so big, it's midnight in our life. And this is the story of Paul and Silas and they're in prison. It says, one day as we were going down to the place, this is Luke writing this. As we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had, who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated. That's a big word. Paul gets exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her and it instantly left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities of, of the, at the marketplace. And the whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews. They shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas. And the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten. And when they were thrown into prison, the jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape so the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Now, I've never been to prison before, but this is not how I would expect my prison experience to go. Like, you imagine, you think about prison, you think about jail, there's all these conversations that go on, right? The question is, what are you in for, right? Ever seen a movie about prison? It's like, what are you in for? And they're like, oh, I'm a, like, murder. 
uh, like I was for theft or maybe tax evasion or I got in a fight. Or, well, all these things. And then they ask Paul and Silas, what about you? What brought you in today, right? Like, what brought you into the prison today? And they go, oh, there's this demon-possessed girl and who's really just annoying me. And so I, she kept following us. So one day I just cast a demon out of her and then they beat us up and brought us here. That's why I'm here today. And then always the next question, so did you do it, right? They're like, yeah, of course we did. She was annoying, right? Like, of course, like this annoying girl, like she's causing a ruckus. Like, so we cast a demon out and here we are beaten in the stocks. That's why... We're here. That's how, I can imagine like the conversations in the prison. Like, like that's probably how it may have gone. Why are you here today? Sometimes in life, do you know what happens is we end up in somewhere we don't want to be and we don't know why we're there. Have you ever ended up in life in a situation or a moment or a circumstance that you did not expect? You, you ended up in a place where you thought you would never go. This is where Paul and Silas, they find themselves in prison. For really, they didn't even do anything wrong. All they did was cast a demon out of a girl and her owners were like, yo, I don't like that. Now I can't make all the money I want. So we got to send these guys. A mob comes to get beaten by sticks and thrown into p- prison. I think a lot of us, we feel like we're in the middle of gloom and that fear is a constant nagging. This constant hurt in our heart is just fear is creeping in over and over and over. You know, maybe today, that's how you feel. You feel like there's just this darkness maybe around you. You feel like, like you're, 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 you feel like you're doing everything you're supposed to do, yet still, you're not where you want to be. You're, you're not in the place that you want to be. You know, maybe they wanted to be in the palace, but they found themselves in the prison. And sometimes we think we're going to end up in the palace, but we end up trapped behind bars and shackled by the weight of the world around us and the weight of our family and the weight of our work is just bearing us down. It's keeping us stuck in a place. Maybe life for you has been tough. Maybe it feels like in your life you can't get a win right now. You feel like you can't go another day. You feel like everything is just piling on and on and on. It's like, God, when am I going to get a break from all this? When, when am I going to get a break? You feel like you're just getting beaten by the world. Maybe you feel like your finances are starting to come together. And then all of a sudden your property tax bill comes in the mail. Maybe you feel like you're doing well with your children when it came to being angry and snapping at them, but then their listening ears stopped working for a bit too long this week. And you had a moment that you, you wish you hadn't had. And you feel like, God, like, why do I keep going back to this place? Why do I end up over and over and over and over again, back in this place, life is a way of beating us down. And sometimes it's even just our inner voice of insecurity, the whisper that's louder than anything we could ever hear, of you're not good enough and you, you can't make it out, you're stuck. If you look through scripture, there's a lot of times where people are thrown into prison and beaten for a lot of crazy reasons, but there's a guy named Joseph who had a similar thing happen to him. He's a man who was thrown into prison really for no real reason. And Joseph, the son of Jacob, and what he said in response to his brothers, they're afraid because their dad has just died and they're afraid of what Joseph is gonna do to them. They don't know because they're living in his, in like his palace. They're like, what are we gonna do? And this is what he says in Genesis 50, verse 19. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Why? Am I God that I can punish you? He says, you intended to harm me but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. The things that oftentimes the world, the enemy, the people we love, that sometimes they intend to harm us, God says, no, I'm gonna turn it around for your good. I'm actually going to use your pain, and sometimes our pain actually is what becomes our purpose. The things that really weighed us down and, and hold us captive actually become our story, become our testimony. We can share of the freedom, and we can share of the joy, and we can share of the peace that we got with no explanation in the middle of the hardest moments. God can use our hardest moments and turn them for good. You might not feel like you're where you want to be right now. You might not feel like it, but God will use the moment you're in. God will use what you're going through. He will use your pain. He didn't cause it, but he might use it for his glory. I'm sure Paul and Silas weren't very pumped about being beaten and thrown in prison that day. 
I bet you that's probably not where they thought they would end up. They're walking around. God's moving. They, they, this girl's like a demon comes out of her. And they're like, yeah, we did it. And then all of a sudden they're beaten and thrown in prison. I know I wouldn't have been so excited about it. Like I can barely sleep in my own bed that I paid a lot of money for, let alone strapped to the floor on concrete. I wouldn't have been very excited about it. But I think that God can often turn our prison and turn it into a place of freedom. And if we continue in this story in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, and this is where it says, it says, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. You know, the darkest time of day in a dimly lit prison. It's gloomy. It's dark. What, ex- what sounds would you expect to hear in that moment? For me, I would probably expect to have some grimacing because they were beaten up. They were not comfortable. Some grimacing, maybe that I would expect some sighing, maybe even some weeping, maybe even some anger. Snoring, maybe. You got a guy who just fell asleep. You got to remember, it's quiet. What do you hear? And, and it's interesting because what was the sound that came out of that prison that night was singing. The sound that came out of those cells, the, the sound that came out of the mouths of the men who, were, who had just been beaten, who were thrown in prison, who were strapped up and they couldn't barely even move. What's coming out of their mouths is hymns and singing and praise. The question I have is what happens in our life When we get to midnight, it's the darkest time of the day. Everything feels like we're falling apart. We feel like we can't even go one more day. We're in so much pain. What do you do when midnight comes in your life? When you're in the hardest moments, what do you do? When the darkness is real and your pain level is deep, what do you do in your darkest and most painful moments? As I think about these men, how, how did they get to a point where the first response was, we're going to praise? Or the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pray. We're going to sing hymns. And it's beautiful because they're singing and all the other prisoners are just listening. Because I'm sure they were like shocked. Like these guys should not be singing right now. How did they do it? How did they sing songs when they didn't have the lyrics on the screen, when they didn't have the hymn book in front of them, when they didn't have the worship leader in front of them? How did they actually worship in those moments when they didn't have anyone leading them? But the reality is, is that what you practice during the day is what comes out at midnight. Right? What, what do you do during the day? Are you spending time memorizing the songs and memorizing scriptures? Are you spending time so that way when the darkness comes, you might not have your phone, you might not have your Bible, but what they can take away from you is what's inside of you. What are you putting inside of you? You know, the reality is that midnight is going to come. There's going to be times in life where we feel so broken, so beaten, and so tired, and so weary how are you going to respond? I think it's a great question because to be honest, I think if I think about my life, sometimes I don't know if that would be me. Sometimes, like I said, I'll sleep funny in my $2,000 bed and I can barely walk. What do you do? What you practice during the day comes out at midnight. What are you putting into your soul What are you putting into your soul? If you can't praise God in the mountaintop, it's going to be really tough to praise him in the valley. You know, as humans, we are very good at praising, praising ourselves on the mountaintop and criticizing God in the valley. Look what I did. God, where are you? Sometimes the mountain and the valley are one step away. We're like, God, look at me. Look what I did. And then we get to the valley like, God, where are you? 
If we cannot praise God in the mountaintop, it's going to be very hard to praise him when we're in the valley. Midnight will come. It's guaranteed, right? And James 1, 2 says this, dear brothers and sisters, when, it doesn't say if, it doesn't say maybe they'll come. It says when troubles of any kind come, come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. When troubles of any kind come, consider it great, an opportunity for great joy. If we cannot have joy on the mountain, it's going to be really tough to have joy in the valley. Some of us, we have everything we ever dreamed of and yet we're miserable. How do we get to a point where we can praise at midnight? Where we are praising even though we're beaten, even though we're tired. Where we are singing even though we should be sighing, we're singing songs to our great and incredible God. See, their love for Jesus was so strong that no matter what they were going through, they were willing to praise. See, they found themselves in the prison, but what was on their lips still was praise. Their love for Jesus was so strong. In 2017, there's this 10-year-old boy named Rushan and he had everything going against him in a family with little money and struggling with his studies. And he was determined to learn how to read so he could write us and sing his own songs. When lunchtime, a teacher brought him in front of his class at the top of his school. And he began to sing this song called Beautiful Day. It's a song that was uh, uh, recorded by Jamaican gospel singer Jermaine Edwards uh, for his 2014 album, Don't Count Me In, Don't Count Me Out. And one of the teachers recorded his performance. And if you fast forward to today, about six years later, we see this guy, this kid, Rushan, you see him all over social media right now. This little, this little kid in his classroom singing this song where tens of millions of people worldwide have watched his, these videos on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube and millions of views. And you know what the lyrics are to this song? It's this, it, it goes, I don't want to act, uh, act too high and mighty because tomorrow I might fall down on my face. And he says, Lord, I thank you for sunshine. I thank you for rain. I thank you for joy. I thank you for pain. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. Right? You know, a lot of us, like, when, when trials come, that's not a song we want to sing. <laughs> Have you ever said, God, I thank you for the pain in my life? That's pretty rare. We have to learn how to praise and even when life is hard, that we can look at each day, no matter how dark it is, no matter how smoky it is, we can say, it's a beautiful day. I may find myself in the prison, but it's a beautiful day today. If I'm still breathing, he's not done, and so we keep on fighting and we keep on going. We're saying thank you for everything that we go through. The sunshine and the rain, the joy and the pain. Thank you for everything we endure. When the threat level in your life gets to midnight and the only song that you have on your mind is a song you remember from the 80s or Baby Shark or I'm a Gummy Bear. You know that song? It's horrible. It's horrible. But I know all these songs and I, I can imagine they're in the prison. Baby Shark, you know, like I'd be like, it's like dude, what are you doing? Man? But what's on your mind? What's in your soul? What's in the deepest parts of who you are? Do you remember the songs where we can sing great is your faithfulness? The songs that when we worship bring us closer to him that even if we're in the valley, even if we're in the prison, we can sing the songs and give him praise in the middle of it all. And then this beautiful moment, the doors start to open and the, and the chains start to break. And imagine this moment, right? Because this is like every prisoner's dream come true. An earthquake opens the entire prison and you're allowed to run away. I don't have to dig a hole. I don't have to crawl through the sewers. I don't have to dig through the concrete. I don't have to swim from Alcatraz. I can just walk away. That's every prisoner's greatest dream. But see what happens, and it's so interesting. I think oftentimes the story we remember... If you know this, or you remember that the prison uh, was open, but look what happens next in verse 28. But Paul shouted to him, right? This is right after the guy said, I'm gonna take my life. He says, stop, 
Don't kill yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, Paul here was like that one kid in your class when you were in like junior high or elementary or high school where class is almost over, the bell is about to ring and you're about to be dismissed. And, but you think about your own thing. You're like, man, I didn't do my homework last night because video games were more important last night. And so I didn't do my homework and the teacher hasn't asked for it. So like, I'm about to make it. Praise the Lord. I'm about to make it out. And then the one kid puts up their hand and goes, Mrs. Pomeroy, what about our homework from yesterday? You know that kid? That's Paul. <laughs> we are all here. Imagine they're the prisoners. And I don't know why. I've been here for weeks. That's to my moment. And I, we're all here. Now, that it doesn't make sense, right? Like, like all these prisoners, what, they're listening to the hymns. They're listening to the songs. They're listening to the prayers. And then when the walls, the gates open, their chains are gone, what do they do? They don't even move. They don't even move. This is the power of when we worship. In the midst of all of it, when we worship, people will look at you and be like, why? Why? We are all here. The question I think this jailer, right, he's like, why? I have failed my duty as the jailer. He's like, I got specific instructions to make sure these guys didn't get out and the gates are open, an earthquake came, I don't know what to do, I'm gonna lose my life anyway, I might as well take it myself. Why are you here? And the question that comes out of his mouth is what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? He's like the earthquake came and freed you, you're free. Why are you here? What must I do to have the same faith that you have? What must I do? Because I saw you get beaten. I saw how tight they strapped you down. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. Why are you here? The beautiful thing is that God is in the business of saving people. And sometimes the salvation of people comes when they see us endure and still find joy. Sometimes people are waiting for you and I in the midst of trials and and all of it, to still have joy. And when they see joy in our eyes, when they see joy on our faces, it may transform their life because they think, I want to have the same faith. I want to have the same courage. I want to have the same strength that in the midst of all I'm going through, I'm still going to be okay. That's what some people are waiting for. But the thing is, they they found the miracle. I think when we read the story, at least for a long time, I was like, man, the miracle is the prison doors opening. It's a miracle. It is. But I think they saw the door and they thought this is still an opportunity. The door's open, but it might not be time to go through. Again, they didn't have to dig holes or carve out a concrete. This is the greatest moment of their lives. Escape is here. What they've been dreaming about, yet they stay put. See, your freedom isn't the only thing that God is after. Yes, he's for your freedom. But what if the salvation of other people can happen at the exact same time? What if your story can actually be something that draws people closer to Jesus? I think sometimes we get so caught up in our victory. We often don't see anything else and we often don't really care about anything else. We got the victory. We got the breakthrough. We finally got it. Yet, there's no one else. There's no one there. We don't see the struggles of the people around us, so we miss out on opportunities to share Jesus. See, for Paul and Silas, escape wasn't their end goal. In fact, if you read the end of the story, you see them actually, they find out that they're, that they're Roman citizens and like, well, we should not have even sent you to prison. This was like a one night moment. Like they're in like the tank and they're like there for the night. It wasn't gonna be a long-term thing. But because escape wasn't their end goal. See, I don't even think they were praising, hoping for an escape. I, I, maybe they were. I, I wasn't there. But I don't even know if they were praising because they were hoping, well, let's, let's pray so we can see the earthquake. 
I don't think that's what it was. I think there was just like, God, we love you. No matter what, we love you. And they're just sitting there, kumbaya, we're like, we love you, we love you. We love you, how he loves us, right? And the earthquake comes, we're like, that's pretty neat. Now let's wait, see what else happens, right? And they probably kept praising. Escape wasn't their end goal. They were gonna be coming out the next day. But a lot can happen in one night if we're open to what God is speaking and what he, where he is leading. A lot can happen in one night. I think midnight, we get to midnight and we think, wow, like this is really tough. And yes, it is. It's extremely tough. But morning always comes, right? Morning always comes. We don't get stuck at midnight. It's not like we look at the clock and it's 12 for the rest of our lives. It's a moment. But what we do is we take this moment and we turn it into our entire story. You know, this takes humility, what Paul and Silas did here, right? They're saying, I will do whatever it takes to present Jesus to people in a way that they understand and that will draw them to them, even if it means sacrificing my freedom so someone else can find salvation, it's worth it. He says, don't take your life. Don't do it. He goes, don't take your life. Let me introduce you to Jesus. Your salvation is more important to me than my freedom. If we continue in the story, Acts 16, uh, verse 31. So this is after he says, hey, what, sirs, m- what must I do to be saved? He says, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Now that part of the story, every time I read that, like, that, th- that's unbelievable, right? The jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. And he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they believed in God. You know, I think often we think the the earthquake, the big things are the miracle. Do you know what the greatest miracle of the story is? This moment. The earthquake, yeah, it's powerful, right? Like it's beautiful. Like I'm sure like it was people were in awe, like, whoa, where why are my chains off? But the greatest miracle was this moment. There's the epic earthquake, the cell doors open, the chains are broken. But the greatest miracle is that God can turn an enemy into a friend. The one who hurt them also cared for them. The one who was their captor became their caregiver. That's what God can do in a moment if we let him. God can turn our hardest moments and turn it for good. Like Joseph talked about, right? Like like you intended this for evil, but God intended it for good. The yes, I had to go through so many years in prison and as a slave, but look where I am today. You're actually alive because of what happened. And our takeaway today is this right here. This is what you practice during the day comes out at midnight. I think if we want to really summarize it all, midnight's going to come. Are you ready? Are you ready? Now I know like you might be like, wow, I feel so encouraged. Midnight's coming, woo, you know? I think all of us have been alive long enough to know we're not always on the mountain. I want to end with this story today that I came across. It says, in a recent sermon, uh, Wayne Cordario, pastor of New Hope Christian Fellowship in Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, he shared an experience he had on a trip to China where the church went to train leaders. The pastor shared how 22 Christians from the, uh, from, the, from the province they were in took a 13-hour train ride to attend the leadership training held at a 700-foot square, uh, square foot hotel room. Out of the 22 Christians present there, 18 of them had been in prison for their faith. For their faith. If we get caught, what will happen to me? The pastor began asking. He said, they say, well, you will get deported in 24 hours and we will go to prison for three years. The Chinese Christians told him. 
After beginning his lesson, the pastor realized he only had 15 Bibles to pass around, so seven people went without Bibles. He said, I said, uh, turn to 2 Peter 1. We were going to read it. Just then, one lady uh, handed hers to the person next to her, and I thought, very interesting. As the Christians began reading, he quickly realized why she had given her Bible away. She had memorized the entire book, the entire Bible. When it was done, I, I went over to her at break and said, you recited the whole chapter. She, she replied, in prison, you, you have much time in prison, right? And he said, don't they confiscate the Bible, he asked. She said that while any Christian material is indeed confiscated, people smuggle in scripture written on paper and hide it from the prison guards. And she says, this isn't so powerful. She says, that's why we memorize it as fast as we can because even though they can take the paper away, they can't take what's hidden in your heart away. Following the three-day training session, one Chinese Christian man asked the pastor, could you pray that one day we could be just like you? And then this right here. He said, I looked at him and said, I will not do that, he replied. He goes, you guys rode a train for 13 hours to be here. He says, in my country, if you drive more than one hour, people won't come. I think, you know, a lot of us, you know, maybe in our lives we may never end up being in prison for what we believe. You know, that's the beauty of this country we live in. It may never happen to us. But the faith that it takes to say, you know what? They can take away my physical Bible, but they can never take away what I've written on my heart. That God so loves me the beauty of who he says you are. I think all of us, we have to learn, we have to learn how to memorize, to remember, to let our faith shine bright for everyone to see. See, in the darkest prison, in the gloom, I said even the, the jailer had to ask for the lights, right? In there, it was still so bright because their faith shone brighter than the darkness. So I think all of us, when, when life comes, because it's going to, life's going to get hard. There's going to be moments that are painful when the, when, when the threat level of our life is getting so dark and so gloomy. We have to ask ourselves, what am I going to do? All right, what am I going to do? Am I going to complain and criticize God and say, where are you? Or am I going to say, I love you, thank you. I consider it pure joy what I'm going through it's hard it's really hard when you're face to face with your deepest fear or your deepest insecurity when you're face to face it's hard but I'm telling you when you endure when you make it through when the courage comes when you get the strength and you go and you have joy it can transform an entire families it can transform entire cities and towns and homes when people see the faith that we have in our hardest moment and so I want to pray for us and I pray that we can learn how to face the hardest moments as best as we can and learn how to praise and memorize what God is speaking that even if it's all taken away if everything is stripped away and we're beaten and we're broken praise can still be what's on our lips so Father we thank you for how good you are to us and God I pray that you help us have courage God, I pray that you help us have strength. God, I pray that you help us have joy in the midst of every trial. That when a trial comes, we ask the question, how can I find an opportunity for joy in this? And that we'll be there for one another in our hardest moments. And so God, I thank you that you are guiding us, you're leading us, you're taking care of us, you're providing for us, you're healing us. And so God, we love you and we praise you today in the midst of it all. We praise you for how good you've been to us. In Jesus' name, amen.